This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Church Street United Methodist Church. We are in the season of Easter and these next few weeks we will be looking uh, during our sermons at the letters of John, so 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. I invite you to join us in person if you are able for our next Master Art Series installment. The ETSU Corral will be here Tuesday evening, April 16th. Also, here at the church, we are collecting canned meats, Spam and Vienna sausages for our uh, Wesley House Center, uh, you, or you can make a donation online if you're not able to bring those. We are just glad that you participate with us in worship and in the other ministries of our church. And now let us open our hearts and minds as we prepare to worship Almighty God. Let us join together in Psalm 36. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Oh. Uh -huh. 
Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Light of the world, shine upon us and disperse the clouds of our selfishness, that we may reflect the power of the resurrection in our life together. Amen. Our scripture today is from 1 John 1, 1, 1 through 2, 2. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things, so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the Christ, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is interesting reading these words from 1 John the day before an eclipse. Thanks to science, we know that in Knoxville, a partial eclipse will begin at 1.49 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. East Tennessee is predicted to see an 85 to 90 percent eclipse, with the peak partial eclipse occurring around 3.07 p.m. and ending at 4.23 p.m. Your children are being dismissed from school so they can go home and experience the eclipse safely with you. There is no such thing as a partial eclipse in this epistle to early Christians. There is either light or darkness. Total darkness is really hard to come by these days. We have street lights, We have floodlights that turn on when motion is detected. When I was growing up, we had night lights plugged into outlets in the hallway and in the bathroom. A night light was reassuring and offered safety in case you had to get up in the night. I think about walking through my house now at 2 a.m. when I'm having trouble sleeping or need that drink of water. There is a glow from the den where the aura frame is on the mantle as photographs scroll through through 24 hours a day. 
The glow from the street lights outside and our neighbor's porch lights provide a bit of light inside my house. Walking past our office, there are tiny yellow and blue lights on the computer, the monitor, and the printer. The laptop plugged into the wall is charging. It has a light. My kitchen has at least three lighted panels telling me it is 2.11 a.m. The microwave, the stove, the coffee pot, they all seem to twinkle and say, go back to bed. Even though it is dark, there is still enough light to navigate through safely. John warns early Christians that they may be kidding themselves about being in the light. It's not really dark. We've become accustomed to darkness. We can fool ourselves into thinking there is no darkness. I'm all good, we would say. No, you're not, John says. We just had Easter Sunday, and it was glorious. Happy Easter, resurrection, alleluia, lots of celebration. Pastor Tim reminded us in his children's time that Easter lasts 50 days. The church season of Easter lasts 50 days. So here we are on the eighth day of Easter. For the next few weeks, we will be reading from 1st and 2nd John. These writings do not contain the familiar stories of Jesus appearing to the disciples in an upper room after the resurrection or on the shore for breakfast. John is writing to a community who knows all about that. We know all about that. John is reminding the community that having experienced Easter means that we live in a certain way. We live in the light. But he has observed Christians who are in darkness. What is that darkness? When you read commentaries on the letters of John, they tell you that these letters, or more accurately, essays, are an internal document written from within the community of faith to the community to the community of faith. This is not an affirmation to be proclaimed or an evangelical writing to be shared with the world. This is just for us, talking just to those in the group. There is a division a schism. Imagine that. For those who say, oh, we wish we could be like the early church where they all got along. Well, by the end of the first century, there is division. And some Christians are not treating each other very kindly. And they are losing sight of the good news of Easter and the new life we have in Jesus Christ. We get this information later on in the letter. There is disagreement about who Jesus is, the nature of Jesus. Was he really human? Surely he was just divine. How could he be God and be human? Those were the questions that were being asked and debated. Our writer is not focusing, he's focusing not so much on the theological debate as he is lifting up what it means to be a part of the community. The resurrection has happened. Communities of faith have formed, and communities of faith are beginning to divide. Just because we are in the church, where there is light, it's easy to say, I'm all good. I have no sin. I love everybody. John says, you are not fooling anyone. <laughs> You're not fooling God. Well, I can say, I've not robbed a bank, I've not embezzled money from my employer, I have not broken the windows of my neighbor's house, I do not have sin. John says, look deeper. If you have disdain for your brothers and sisters, you have sin. If you put others down, you have sin. If you talk about other church members, you have sin. If you characterize one group in the church as those troublemakers or those liberals or those extremists or those traditionalists or those who don't do anything or those whatever, you have sin. If you speak of your discipleship as right and others as lacking or wrong, 
you have sin. John says, let's save us all some time. Just confess your sin. Just admit it, that you've not been kind to everyone here. Just admit it, confess. Where there is confession, there is forgiveness, and then there is transformation, and there is true fellowship. We hear the word fellowship frequently in this passage. You're familiar with the Greek word koinonia. It is translated here and in Acts and in 1 Corinthians as fellowship. It is also translated as communion, as in being joined together in Christ. As we celebrate Holy Communion, we experience koinonia. It is fellowship beyond church socials. It is fellowship beyond a covered dish dinner. John is reminding these early Christians of koinonia and says his joy will be complete when we truly experience that. He is warning the believers against professing a spiritual only Jesus, a divine only Jesus, but reminds us that Jesus came in the flesh. He says in the beginning of his letter, we have seen this, we have touched this, we have heard this, alluding to Jesus's humanity without denying his divinity. When we dismiss Jesus's humanity, it is easier to dismiss one another. When I hear the word fellowship, I think of one of the favorite hymns of our faith. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. We sang it a lot on Sunday night worship at my first appointment. John would say, that's a nice hymn, but it is missing some verses. Yes, we can lean on the arms of Jesus, but because of Jesus's incarnation, because Jesus came in the flesh and ate and drank with us and walked with us, we live out our faith incarnationally. We are present with each other and experience the living Christ in and with each other. So as we lean on the arms of Jesus, we link arms with one another. That is koinonia. That is the fellowship John speaks about. Even when we are going through hard times or disagree with one another, we begin our profession of faith first together in the living Christ. Then we can sing, what a fellowship, what a joy divine. That is the fellowship that we are invited to participate in with each other each Sunday and every day. Amen. The Lord calls us to draw close and examine the wounded hands and feet of the risen one and to know the depth of his love for us. Let us therefore approach the throne of God in confidence as we pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all the people according to their needs. Let us pray. Ever loving Lord, enter our hearts and move us to faith in Jesus as the risen one. Convince us of the reality and significance of the resurrection and free us from all manner of fears and phobias. Give us courage in the face of death, knowing that this is the gateway to new resurrected life for those who trust in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with your church throughout the world so that its preaching and works of love may continue to testify to our Lord's resurrection. Wherever your church is faithless and lacking in courage to do the work that Jesus has given, visit it and build it up with your spirit with all our pastors so they may listen well and then speak with Christ's authority. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring, priest, bring peace to all parts of the earth, wherever nations are at war and people are divided. Visit and bring true reconciliation. We pray particularly for all Christian people in these nations that you may help them to influence their country for the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Wherever homes are disrupted by anger and bitterness, 
and wherever relationships are distorted and dulled, visit and bring peace and harmony. Wherever young people are gathered in your name, visit and guide them with your holy word and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Visit and comfort the sick and suffering too, dear Lord. Heal and strengthen weak bodies, calm and correct confused minds. We pray for those we know with particular needs. Support them all with your great love and mercy and be with those others known to us and whom we, know, we now name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we present these prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is risen from the dead, and we join together now in that prayer which he has taught us, praying, Our Father, who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we move into a new week together, I pray that you know full well the love of Almighty God, the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and for always. Amen.